morning, everyone. Um, I have to say, I've, I think I've said this a couple of times, but every Sunday I see us all gathered together, I'm, I'm extremely encouraged. Um, I'm encouraged that they are continuously people united together seeking God. And every time I say it, it's never part of my preparation. It's never part of the message. It's just something that I really feel so strongly in my heart that it just overflows that I really want to share it before I even share anything else. Um, so it's wonderful seeing you all together. It's wonderful seeing various hearts knit together in seeking God. Um, that encourages me, and I feel that it encourages God as well. Um, God is glorified, and He's made joyful by the fact that we gather together in His name. And I think that it's important that every now and again we're reminded of that. It's not just us coming together on a Sunday and saying, oh yes, it's Sunday again, oh no. It's literally glorifying God and in filling us with His presence and connecting with one another. <clears throat> but before I start a different message, which wasn't part of the preparation, <clears throat> I'd like to ask if anyone here in this week had enough time to do everything that they intended to do. Every now and again when you ask questions, you expect maybe a random raise of hand every now and again, but I have to be honest, in asking this question, I know that there was absolutely... 100% chance, I might be wrong, there's always that one guy. You know that one guy? <laughs> but generally he's not here, but that one guy who has enough time for everything, to be able to fit in everything that he wants to do. And this morning, as we share this message and as we look into this message, I'm reminded in this week where I've been struggling to get to certain things, to try and do everything that I'm supposed to do and not having enough time and some people having grace and other people not and it's... it's myself having grace on myself and sometimes not having grace on myself because sometimes you you can admit to yourself okay but it's fine things are chaotic in your life so there's there's time for you to sort of give yourself some time and grace but then other times you're like okay listen i know all of this is ha happening but yet stuff needs to get done at the end of the day this is the most important thing Excitement of a two-year-old. But in saying all of that, I think if we put the time aspect on one side, and then on the other hand, I think very often we have an admiration for people who have seemed to achieve these things. We have an admiration for people who have achieved great successes in life. When you, some people might look at historical figures like Abraham Lincoln or Alexander Graham Bell, or, you know, great inventors of their day, or maybe, um, you know, historical figures in war. Some people have an admiration for generals and people who su succeeded a lot of things. I see that there's a new Napoleon movie coming out. Um, and like these things remind us that it took us a lot of effort and planning and difficulties and overcoming of difficulties to actually get us to where we are today. You know, our country went through a whole lot of different things and, and, and fights and agreements and disagreements to get us to this point. And if we look back, we can have an admiration to those people. But yet that always feels so distant. But now I sort of want to bring this a bit closer to us. Every now and again, we have people making an influence in our life, whether, it's, whether they are able to achieve things in a certain time or whether they just actually made a connection because they loved us, because they accepted us or because they did something extraordinary in our lives. They maybe said something that, that diverted your life for a purpose, and a good purpose. Sometimes it might be meeting your spouse, sometimes it might be all of these different things, but all these things have an outpouring in your life, but it all comes down to seizing an opportunity or seeing things in your life and, and creating this opportunity to... to, to Get the most out of that moment, if I can put it that way. And I'm saying, Johanna, how does this have to do anything with anything? Well, to be completely honest, at the beginning of this week, um, I was telling Sophia, I think it was about on Tuesday, I told her, well, listen, I've, I've read the next following passages, and I have to be honest, although I know it's biblical and it's wonderful, it's just really, I don't, 
I don't feel it. Like I don't have that inspiration of God saying, okay, this is the message that you need to bring across. And the only reason I share this is not because I want you to think that every week is heavily God breathed, although I do believe that it is, but that's not the reason. But I, I firmly feel that sometimes we need to bring this encouragement and a reminder that when you start off something, you don't always necessarily feel it. You start off and you, and you read your Bible and it's like, well, that doesn't mean anything. But then what happens if you continuously reflect on it and think about it, then something else will happen and then God's like, that's it. And this week as I was preparing, I realized that I didn't have time to prepare, which very much fits into today's passage. And I want to read the passage. It's extremely short. It's only about four, four verses long, which is much shorter than some weeks that we've had here where we've covered entire chapters and things like this, but I still feel that it's a full message. Now, Jesus was going on in his ministry, and we've seen him work in his life and those around him, and we've seen his disciples rise and fall, and random people rise and fall. And then we get to this interjection, if you will, where it says, And as they went, they entered into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So whose house is it? Martha. Okay? She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Then tell her to help me. And Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken from her. I want to read that passage again. I want you to really focus on the small things. It's really it's a short passage, as you just saw. But listen to it. Like I mentioned last week, just because you've heard the story before doesn't mean that we should sort of rub it off until we get the message. And as they went, starting from verse 38, he entered into a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So this woman, Martha, we need to focus on this. She welcomed Jesus into her house. So she took upon herself the responsibility to serve and to welcome him and to provide everything. So the fact that she is trying to serve and get everything ready makes sense. It's her responsibility. You don't go into someone else's house and then quickly start making coffee. Okay, some of you do. But, but that's a good thing. But the responsibility lies on the host. So technically it is her responsibility. But was she doing what was necessary or was she just continuously trying to serve? She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his teaching. Which means it wasn't just Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. There were others. But yet her own sister caused a vision and out of jealousy said, Jesus, don't you see? Calling out her own sister. Like, just let that sink in for a moment. Instead of going to her sister and saying, Mary, can you please assist me? I still, I still need to finish this. She immediately tries to do this tattletale thing of saying, Jesus, I, I, I want you to see me, but I also want you, to, want you to see the faults of others. Specifically my sister, whom apparently I'm jealous of. If I look at what I'm seeing here. But Martha was not trying to do what was necessary. She wasn't doing what was required. She was distracted with much serving. In the beginning, I keep on thinking about this passage, and we always think, well, yes, there's stuff that needs to be done. But what I get from this text is not that they were doing what they had to do. They were doing something additional, something extra, something that wasn't necessary. Everyone else was already seated and comfortable by the looks of things. Her focus wasn't on that what it was supposed to be on. She was distracted in serving. So her heart was good because very often we can look at life and say, yes, but they're serving in the church. They're so powerful. They're helping. They're doing so many good things. Is their thoughts and their focus on the serving or is their, thirds, their thoughts and their focus on Jesus? Because there's a difference. There's a very, very big difference. And then... Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone or left me to serve alone? Isn't this how ironic how some people 
us at certain times. This is not just those people, by the way. We are all martyrs at some stage or another. I just quickly want to clarify that. I'm not throwing other people under the bus. We're all lying under the bus. The moment we start feeling left out, the moment we start wondering why we can't hear Jesus, despite the fact that He's there, because we're so focused on other things, we keep on wondering about other things. We keep on getting distracted about things and serving and helping and trying to be seen. But yet at the end of the day, she has left me to serve alone. So now she's feeling insecure. She's feeling bad. This is something that we need to focus on. Tell her to help me. So now, not only is she feeling insecure in the fact that Jesus doesn't love her, she's also feeling, Jesus, tell her what to do. Tell her to come and help me. Because very often, and this is how it very often works. I'll put this down just for a moment. And I don't know if you've noticed this before. Just quickly fix this. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But every now and again, when people start getting insecure and when people start feeling offended, they take a hierarchy or they start taking a higher position, start telling other people what to do and they start pointing out the faults of others. Because what we do is when we see other people not doing what we feel we need to do, then we start going to Jesus and telling Him what to do. We start looking at the world around us and say, Jesus, don't you care? How can you let this happen? Did Jesus ever instruct her to do the things that she was doing? I remember I got backlash from that once, a long time ago. In saying something when, when stuff happened, I realized in the service I said, did you ever ask God whether you should do what you're doing now because now it has failed and you're blaming God? And I don't think that that should be the case. Because I feel that that's a valid question. You see, when I look at this passage, there's a couple of things that stand out for me. Number one, it's what we do instinctively. Our first response is to see the faults of others. But Jesus, I'm doing so much. Like I'm serving you. I want to be seen. Like I'm, I'm, I'm reading all these texts. I'm watching all these videos. I'm doing all these things. What about Him? Like Jesus, you laid it on my heart to stop doing certain things. But He's still doing it. And I can just hear Jesus in the background. That is very true and well done. But that's not what I'm working with, with him currently. You can just see that happening because we like to point out the faults of others like we are God. And at the same time, we don't realize that in doing this, in continuously bringing other people to God, we are essentially and directly telling God, by the way, you're not doing what you're doing. I need to micromanage you. That's what we're doing. What other people are doing has got absolutely nothing to do with us except if God has directly placed them under your authority and responsibility. That when it, that's when it starts to matter. Sophia, Gabby and Alina are under my biblical authority. So I have the responsibility to guide them, to lead them in a certain direction. That's, that's on me. There's a larger scope thing where everything that each one of you who is knit together in this united body as a church falls on me. That's an extremely scary thought. Because one day I'm going to be having to give an account on this. There's a text that I wasn't planning on reading, but I feel that this is important for us to read because it also touches on the next point. But now I'm probably going to take about 10 hours to find the text. No, I'm just kidding. I was just wasn't expecting to find Colossians so quickly. So it's in Galatians 1, because I don't want to make this pause even longer than it already was. 
But I want to encourage you to read Colossians when you get home. It's four chapters. It's going to literally take you ten minutes. And it starts off in Colossians 1. And he starts speaking to this church that truly encourages him. And then he says something, how we are presenting ourselves to God. And it brings us back to what Sean preached a couple of weeks ago in reminding us that everything that we do, we are presenting ourselves as brides to Christ. So when someone is under your authority, that's when you have the responsibility to not go to God and say, listen, you need to fix him, because remember, he's under your authority, which means you need to fix him. That's how it works. But if someone is not under your authority, then it's got nothing to do with you. What we can do is we can directly go to someone and say, listen, this is offending me, or this is bothering me, or can you please help me? Because we do have a Christian and believer's responsibility towards one another to say, listen, we need to work together. So that's the first part. The first thing that we do when we start feeling that God is away from us is we start looking at the faults of others, and that is wrong. But what we very often do is we start thinking, God, I'm so busy, I don't have the time. I just quickly want to finish this and then I'll get to you. Or is this just me? Well, I think to myself, okay, Jesus, I just want to finish this project and then I'll devote everything to you. I just want to finish this and then I can spend more time in prayer. I can spend more time in this. I can do, then I'll be yours. Just help me succeed in this. And the moment that happens, it's like everything else. The moment you, you, you get something new, it means that you need to get something else. I remember in high school, they, they taught us about complementary, complementary products. If you buy coffee, it generally means that you want to buy milk. If you want to, some people then also require to have, you know, to have sugar. Some people also are required to maybe have a kettle if they don't have one. If you're living in Bathurst and you don't have good water, then you need to buy water. This is how life works. Every time we add something to our life, it means that we generally need to add something else. So that's the second thing that we need to stop doing. Because it says that she was distracted by much serving. It wasn't she was focused on her serving that she was placed under authority over. She was distracted by serving. She was distracted by doing everything that wasn't her responsibility at that stage. Everything seems to be set. Everyone else is seated and ready, but now she's continuing to faff over this and faff over that. And our hearts might be good, but what often leads to this is we start wondering, God, where are you? Meanwhile, he's there and you're not taking your place. And your place is supposed to be just on the floor, by his feet. We're not taking the time to go spend with him. And I say taking the time because very often I, I speak to my French students and instinctively they start speaking about, I didn't take the time to do this. And, and technically you can say that, but we say we make time for something. Isn't that really how we generally speak? But there's something so much better about taking the time. Because you can't make time. That's the amount of time that you've got. So we're giving ourselves a false hope. We had a preacher share with us once, like you can have all the busy things in the world happen, but the moment your geezer bursts, there's enough time for you to generally stop, take half a day off, fix the geezer, get the plumber out, get everything sorted, mop everything up, and then generally... For the most part, you'll still be able to finish everything that you were supposed to finish. Might be a touch late, but you'll get there. Generally, that's how we function. The moment there's an emergency, we do it. You make time for something. You, you take the time out of your 24-hour day, and there's somehow time to do that because it's an emergency. But the thing that we fail to realize is our spiritual health and the fact that we are able to continue in our Christian walk is the same as a, geezer, as a geezer bursting. We need to make the time to do this first before we can do anything else. Because what happens is if we don't consult Jesus first about what we need to do, we get continuously busy doing things. And Jesus is like, she has chosen the one good thing that you had to do. The one good thing that you had to do was sit at my feet and listen. You can do the dishes next week, you can do that whenever, you can do this then. What's the major thing now? And that was to be at my feet and listen to my teaching. Because tomorrow I'm going to be away. Tomorrow I'm not going to be there. The major thing for us to realize is that every single day we need to be sitting at Jesus' feet. Now for some of us this sounds so Christianese and I hate it when we do this because we get so spiritual that we start disconnecting reality from what we actually believe. We say, oh, I'm at Jesus' feet. And half of the church is like, but what does that mean? 
where do I need to sit specifically and how? What that means is you need to sit with your Bible and read, but not, okay, now I'll finish my chapter. Okay, God, done. Johan said, read Colossians. It's going to take me 10 minutes. It's taking 12, so I'm going to stop after 10. I'll read the next tomorrow. No. It literally takes 10 minutes, depending on your reading speed. Such a good book. It just it, it summarizes everything. But what I want to encourage us to do is we need to sit down and read our Bibles and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And sometimes we'll get nothing from it. And then two weeks later we realize, oh, well, that's what it means. Okay, that's cool. Because maybe you didn't need, like when you're eating, you don't need the vitamin C now, but you're going to need it tomorrow. And you might not feel the fact that you're getting all these vitamins and minerals into your body, but when you need it, you'll get it. That's the most important thing. But then with that, there's this accompaniment of worship that some of us just found foreign. I don't know what that is. It's ironic how there's a lot of distractions when we start speaking about distraction. And I mean it because if there's one thing that Satan can try and stop us from doing, it's from getting distracted. That's the one thing that he wants to do the whole time. He wants to distract us. I want to encourage us. Let's focus on this message. Let's focus on what God wants us to do. Because in speaking of worship, I believe that some of us don't know how it feels to just sit and put some worship music on. Google it, YouTube it, I don't care. And just sit and just sit there for 15 minutes thinking about the things of God. Thinking about what the song means. Is that right? Is it not? Is it good? Is it not? God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? That's what worship is also. But it's also in how we live. And then the sort of final part of sitting at Jesus' feet is who's Jesus' hands and feet currently? We are. And we forget that. We forget that sit, part of sitting at Jesus' hands and feet currently, today, in our context, means spending time with fellow Christians. That's part of what it means to become a believer and to be a believer. Because very often you have people that they believe, and then they go in isolation. That's what they do the whole time. And, and, and you, you feel like a believer because the world tells you that if you just believe in Christ, then you're saved. And that's wonderful. But that's not what it means. The Bible says explicitly in Hebrews, like, don't neglect the gathering of the saints. Because all of us at some stage or another has been offended by someone or some church or something. It happens. But our responsibility is to go to those individuals and say, listen, I'm being offended, or is this right or is this wrong? If it's unbiblical, then we need to ask God for guidance and then move. There's a message that I, I'm really praying about when I feel that I need to share it with you. But part of that message is in even speaking about the Apostle Paul, which is one of my favorite persons from history in the Bible, Specifically speaks about how not even the Apostle Paul went on this rogue mission according to God's will. Despite the fact that, by the way, he got revelation directly from Jesus himself. If we read the book of Galatians, it speaks about how he came to salvation and he just spent three years just searching the word and searching God and just learning. Then he went to the church leaders. He went to Peter and James and them to say, listen, this is what I'm learning and can you please accept me? And then 12 years later, he went back to them and said, listen, I want to confirm with the church leaders, despite the fact that Paul was a church leader himself, I want to confirm, am I doing things right or am I working in vain? Even the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But what we like to do is we like to live in this rogue Christianity. We like to live in this rogue sense, this Martha. I'll tell you what you need. You need Jesus, but first we need cups. This is what we like to do. And Jesus is like, just, just, just sit. There's one thing for you to do. And I was thinking about this this week, and this is sort of my closing, or how it comes together when speaking about our time management and heroes and achieving success. When we think about achieving success, we think about, you know, making lots of money, marrying a good spouse, um, having a lack of job, or having lots of free time. It's all these worldly things. But yet, true success means to have purpose. True success means to be what you were intended to be. 
And Jesus' response was, sit by my feet. That's what I need from you. And I think about it. There's so many people in this Bible that it, it fathoms me how many people, how many giants in the faith. We have David, we have, you know, we have Solomon, we have Samson, we have all these wonderful people who we look up to and we're like, yo, these people were amazing. Myself, I love to look at, at Paul and how he did things and just how he, he, he never lost track of things. And then I wonder by myself, like, what does it take? And this might be a, 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 a cocky type of answer or question, but what does it take to be included into the Bible? You, you, you know, you, you either need to be a David who conquered and who listened and who slayed, or you need to be a Samson who was strong and all these things. But yet, if we truly look at all these people, number one, all of them were major failures to a large extent. They had major successes, but they were also major failures. David, for example, how he murdered and how he, um, he was a murderer at one point and he was a cheater at another stage. And then you look at Samson, who we, who we grew up as children. He's this hero. Look how many people he slayed. And he did this and he did that. Did everything he did was contrary to what he was destined for until the very end. Saying, Yohan, how can you say that? Well, as a Nazarene or Nazarite, he was not supposed to touch anything dead. Where did he get the honey? From the carcass of the lion. So he touched the dead carcass. That's why he, he, he was so infatuated by this honey, about this instant gratification that he lost sight of his purpose. How did he slay the, I don't know, 10,000 Israelites? Well, not Israelites, the Philistines. With a jaw from the donkey. There's so many things that he did. He intermarried outside of his faith. It wasn't about being an Israelite. There's so many things that he supposedly did wonderful, but everything he did was an absolute trojan from what he was supposed to be. And I say this because we need to be reminded that what it takes is just the faith in God. And this is what Jesus is saying now. We spoke about the 70 last week who were sent out and yet they were unnamed. But they made a difference and we don't know what their difference was. But they came back and we heard that they achieved all the things that the 12 disciples didn't. Mary, what did she do to be included into the most wonderful book in the world? The book that tells us how to gain salvation from hell. She sat. It's like when we went through COVID and people were like, how do you save the world? You just stay at home and you do nothing. And Jesus is like, do you want to be, do you want to be seen by me? Be by my feet. If you want to achieve success and do the one thing that, you, that I need from you, be by my feet. Because when you're at Jesus' feet, when you can hear him closely and intently, that's when he can give you instruction. By the way, give that one a call. Can you please go and kill those people? Can you please go do this if I think about Old Testament times? Please be sure that you listen carefully before you follow those instructions. <laughs> Just a short disclaimer. But I need, us, I need us to understand that there's something that happens when we're at the feet of Jesus. And what I mean by that is listening to him instead of carrying on with life. And if I have time, then I'll be with Jesus. Because this is... And I'm being honest because this is, in this last period, how I've been struggling to cope in a certain extent. Because you're not getting sleep and all of you are tired of hearing me being tired, but that's, that's where I'm at. And you get to this point where it's like, okay, but I need to fix this and fix this. And then you need to sleep less. Find a way. Find a way to make time for Jesus. In whatever way works, whether it's reading Bible, whether it's just having a cup of coffee with a fellow believer, that you see as a mature Christian. Not just someone who says that they're a Christian, and I'm like, oh, I'm doing my Christian favor. We're going we're gonna to go to the pub and have a beer. There's nothing wrong intrinsically with that. There's something intrinsically wrong with not spending time with people more mature than you. Find them. And if you can't find them, be them for someone else. Spend time with us. Connect with people in, in other 412 churches. Spend time with us and connect. That's what we're all called to do. And it feels like a very open message. But I really want to bring this together in the sense of, first and foremost, we need to stop worrying about what other people are doing. That's got nothing to do with you, except if God has placed someone under your direct authority. Which, by the way, is a biblical thing. Secondly, we need to make time for Jesus. We need to make time so that we can actually listen to Him. On a personal level. And then we also need to make time so that we can spend time with our fellow believers, because that's what the church is about. It's not about attending on a Sunday. 
if you're only attending on a Sunday and you're not doing anything else to connect with anyone else in the church, in a godly way, you're still a spectator in his church. It's sad, but it's true. And what very often happens, and I mean this respectfully, it's very often these spectators that get lost and then they get offended by the church the most. And I'm going to be stepping on a lot of toes in this moment. But all of us have been offended by the church at some stage or another, or by God's people. Be honest to yourself. Was that in a moment when you were actively serving, where you felt God was wanting you? Or was it in a time when you were a spectator? When did you get affected, offended by God's people? When you were in His will or outside? Because I feel that that's something that steps on all of our feet. Feet. We get offended and we feel lost when we're not where God wants us to be. We get offended when we're doing dishes instead of being at His feet or serving where He has told us to serve. So for this week and in this time, I want to encourage us, let's connect with, with God. Let's let go of stuff that don't matter and focus on that what does. Let us connect with God personally and let's connect with His people. Because in doing that, then very often we'll realize that we'll have grace for other people, we'll be an example for others, and that they won't just, they'll just be there on a different level, like a family member. That's my hope and my prayer for this morning. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord, I want to say thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity and this responsibility to share your message, Lord. I thank you for the grace that you've given me in this time where Things are chaotic and I apologize for not, for not making enough time for you, Lord. I say that and I share this in this group, Lord. It's difficult, but it doesn't matter, Lord. Where is your priority? Our priorities always need to be with you first, Lord. And I pray this for this group and those who couldn't be here for whatever reason, Lord. I pray that you increase this group, not for this group's sake, Lord, but for your sake. This is your church, Lord. There are people outside here who need your salvation. Provide opportunities for us to minister and to serve unto them according to your will and not to our will, Lord. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace, Lord. Amen.